point six active transport. Active transport is movement of ion or molecules uh, with help of transport protein and it always move against concentration gradient means that it move from low concentration to high concentration it uses carrier protein and it always requires energy powered by atp so since it uses atp to carry out transport uh, across plasma membrane, the cells that undergo active transport have high respiratory rate and have large number of mitochondria to produce ATP. And this will enable the cell to maintain internal concentration of small solute that differ from concentration in environment. Means that it always um, maintain the concentration of small solute uh, it doesn't achieve equilibrium active transport is divided into three one is electrogenic pump second one is core transport the third one is bulk transport so let's uh, look at electrogenic pump first so electrogenic pump is transport protein that generate voltage across plasma membrane voltage is created by difference in distribution of positive and negative ions across plasma membrane so membrane potential is a voltage that created across a membrane so electrogenic pump is transport protein that generate the voltage example of electrogenic pump is sodium potassium pump and proton pump <clears throat> this is sodium potassium pump okay you can see that this is the extracellular fluid and this is the cytoplasm site extracellular fluid have high na plus and it have low k plus compared to cytoplasm it have low na plus and high k plus all right so remember that active transport will always transport substance against its concentration gradient if you follow concentration gradient and a plus should be transported inside because you have high and a plus outside and low and a plus inside however in this case in this active transport Na plus is transported up even though you already have high Na plus in extracellular fluid you will always transport Na plus out into extracellular fluid okay so these are the mechanism of sodium potassium pump Sodium potassium pump will always pump 3 Na plus out, 2 K plus in. Alright, so first you can see that this carrier protein have Na plus binding site and it also have K plus binding site. So Na plus will bind to the carrier protein. And then Na plus binding will stimulate phosphorylation by ATP. Phosphorylation by ATP. Phosphorylation is a process of adding phosphate group to any substance. If you add P, 
phosphate group to any substance, you say that the substance undergo phosphorylation. In this case, the carrier protein is undergo phosphorylation because ATP release its phosphate group and the phosphate group bind to the carrier protein. That's why here you say that phosphorylation by ATP. The phosphorylation is stimulated by Na plus binding. So phosphorylation will cause the protein to change shape. You can see here the protein is already changed its shape. And as it's changed shape, it will expel Na plus outside. Right? Now you have transported three Na plus out. You want to transport two K plus in. Right? So remember K plus is low at extracellular fluid and it is high in uh, cytoplasm. So you wanted to transport K plus from low, from low concentration to high concentration because it is against concentration gradient. So the K plus will bind to K plus binding site. And as K plus bind to the protein, it trigger phosphor, a phosphate group to be released. So as the phosphate group release, the phosphate, the carrier protein uh, will restore its original conformation. Remember that your phosphate group will trigger the protein to change shape. Now that you release the phosphate group, it will return to its original shape. So when it returns to its original shape, K plus will be released into the cytoplasm right and the cycle will repeat proton pump is used mainly in plant bacteria and also fungi it actively transport h plus out of the cell right and you can see here even though uh, the inside of the cell is negative and is for it is positive at extracellular fluid we still wanted to transport h plus out of the uh, cytoplasm into the extracellular fluid because active transport always transport ions or any substance against its concentration gradient all right so h plus is uh, transported from cytoplasm into extracellular fluid this will result in dual energy source they are electrical energy and electrochemical gradient or chemical energy and these two energy source can drive other processes example is the uptake of nutrient using co-transport All right, so now we move on to 3.6.2, which is co-transport. So co-transport is a uh, transport of chemical substance across plasma membrane. And it also requires energy to transport or to move the substance against its gradient. The energy that is used to transport the first substance against its gradient is provided by the movement of another substance along its gradient or down concentration gradient. It means that the first substance is, is transported against its concentration gradient. However, the other substance is transported along its gradient. Example, plant uses H plus gradient that generated before by proton pump to drive the active transport 
of amino acid or sugar into the cell. Alright, so the protein can only transport sucrose into the cell if the molecule travels with H+. That's why we call it co-transport, couple transport. Sucrose cannot enter the cells alone. It needs to be coupled with H+. However, sucrose is transported against its concentration gradient. It is transported from low concentration to high concentration gradient. However, H plus is transported down concentration gradient from high concentration to low concentration. Alright, so look at here. So remember before we have proton pump. Right. So remember that this is outside of the cell or extracellular site and this is cytoplasmic site or inside of the cell. Outside of the cell is positive where inside of the cell is negative. So before this in electrogenic pump remember we use ATP to transport H plus against its concentration gradient out into extracellular fluid. So this is sucrose H plus co-transporter or H plus sucrose co-transporter. So it is couple transport. So if you want to transport sucrose in, you have to take H plus with you. Okay, so it uses diffusion of H plus down electrochemical gradient to drive the uptake of sucrose into the cell again concentration gradient. So remember H+, you have a lot of H+, in extracellular fluid. It will move back into the cell down its concentration, sorry, down its electrochemical gradient. So when H+, move into the cell, it will transport sucrose together into the cell. So remember, you have low H plus in extracellular fluid. You have high. Sorry, you have low sucrose in extracellular fluid. However, you have high sucrose in cytoplasm. But still, you wanted to transport sucrose into the cell against concentration gradient. Another example of co-transport in animal cell is Na plus glucose co-transporter. We look at a situation here. A treatment for a person suffer from diarrhea. Uh, in this treatment, uh, the patient will be given a high concentration of glucose and salt solution. Uh, ORS, or, or, ORS solution. Oral rehydration salt. Okay, so that ORS solution contain high glucose and high NaCl. So, when the patient drink the solution, uh, as usual, it will move into digestive system. Alright, so this is the lumen of intestine. Okay, and this is the epithelial cell of the intestine. As the patient drink uh, high glucose and salt uh, solution, uh, both uh, Na plus and glucose is transported into the epithelial cell and then it will move into the bloodstream. Okay, so this is the blood. Okay, so glucose as well as Na plus will move into the bloodstream. And you can see here Na plus is transported via sodium potassium pump. Okay. So now um, as you have uh, Na plus and glucose in the bloodstream, so your blood now have high solute concentration. So to balance the high solute concentration, uh, the blood needs uh, H2O 
or water uh, to maintain blood concentration. So the intestine, water from the intestine will be absorbed into the cell. Okay, so you can see here, this is aquaporin. And then from the cell, it will move into the bloodstream also via aquaporin. Okay, so movement of H2O is by osmosis, means it is passive transport. It moves from high concentration to low concentration. So remember, in blood, we now have high concentration of solute. So H2O will move into the bloodstream. Okay, so drinking ORS solution or high salt and glucose uh, solution is not a treatment it's not a cure for uh, diarrhea it will not stop it will not stop the diarrhea however it will only rehydrating the patient that suffer from diarrhea to avoid uh, any other complication now we move on to 3.6.3 bulk transport Bulk transport is divided into two other parts, endocytosis and exocytosis. Uh, endocytosis, endo, endo means to transport. Endocytosis is to transport any substance into the cell. So there are three other processes that enable cells to transport any substance into it. So one is phagocytosis. Pinocytosis and the third one is receptor mediated endocytosis. So, bulk transport uh, will enable the cells to transport large molecules. Okay, example is polysaccharide uh, and also proteins, and it requires the cells to form vesicle. So, to move the vesicles the bulk transport requires energy let's look at the first part of bulk transport exocytosis so exocytosis is a process to transport uh, material out of the cell okay we wanted to release the content outside of the cell okay into the extracellular fluid um, Example here is um, any cells. Let's take an uh, example of any cells that uh, made up enzyme. Okay, so remember, enzyme is protein, and protein is um, modified and packed in Golgi apparatus. Okay, so the enzyme or the protein is uh, packed into the vesicle. Okay, and the vesicle will move towards uh, the cell membrane. Okay, and it will fuse with its own plasma membrane. And then it will uh, export their product out of the cell. And yeah, sometimes the enzyme will enter bloodstream and it will... Uh, probably move to any uh, targeted organ okay so other than enzymes uh, probably uh, hormones uh, also will use this type of uh, transport so here we already list some example uh, which is cell in pancreas nerve cells and also plant cells Now let's look at um, endocytosis. So endocytosis is a process to take in macromolecule. Again, it involves vesicles. So you have learned in chapter two that to move a vesicle on the microtubule, you need ATP. Therefore, bulk transport is always an active transport because it uses ATP. Let's look at the first types of endocytosis, uh, which is phagocytosis. Phagocytosis is usually used by unicellular organism. Example is ameba. 
um, in multicellular organism uh, such as human uh, certain types of cells uh, will undergo phagocytosis example is our white blood cell uh, leukocyte neutrophil or monocyte so basically in phagocytosis um, the cells will engulf particle by extending pseudopodium okay so this uh, pseudopodium will be surrounding um, the particles okay and then it will form food vacuole as it forms food vacuole it will fuse with lysosome and lysosome remember in chapter 2 lysosome contain hydrolytic enzyme so lysosome will fuse with this food vacuole it will uh, release hydrolytic enzyme to digest the uh, particles into smaller particles now let's move on to pinocytosis which is uh, the process that is nearly similar to phagocytosis however the difference is it takes up dissolved material rather than solid material in pinocytosis tiny droplet uh, trapped in a fold in the plasma membrane and it will form pinocytic vesicle and then the liquid content will slowly transfer into cytoplasm you should recognize that this uh, pinocytic vesicle is uh, smaller compared to food vacuole that it formed by uh, phagocytosis next we move on to receptor mediated endocytosis this uh, type of uh, endocytosis is specialized and it enables the cells to acquire bulk quantity of specific substance <clears throat> even though they are not very concentrated in the extracellular fluid you can see here there are receptor at the uh, cell membrane and the receptor is always facing extracellular fluid and um, you can see that a specific substance that complementary to the shape of receptor is called a uh, ligand and this ligand will bind to the receptor that's why we say that it is very specific and it able to uh, uptake the substance into the cells even though the substance is in very low concentration and you can see here it is coated pit so coated pit is uh, the region on the membrane containing large number of receptor protein so as the ligand bind to the receptor the coated pit will form uh, vesicles containing bound molecule and then uh, the emptied receptor will be recycled back to the plasma membrane one of the example of uh, receptor mediated endocytosis is the intake of cholesterol uh, molecules into human cells 
These uh, cholesterol molecules are very important for the synthesis of plasma membrane and it is also a precursor for uh, synthesizing other types of steroids. So cholesterol uh, travel in blood as LDL, low density lipoprotein. There are one uh, disease related to defective or missing receptor protein for LDL. It is called hypercholesterolemia. So we can see here, this is normal cell with a receptor for LDL. However, in certain uh, cases, okay, the cells have missing uh, receptor protein. Okay, so this is the mild disease when you have missing of some of the receptor. However, the severe disease is due to completely missing of LDL receptor. Okay, so when you do not have the LDL receptor, you basically unable to take up the LDL from the blood into the cell. So LDL will remain very high level in the blood. So if LDL or cholesterol accumulate in the blood, it will contribute to early atherosclerosis. Both uh, exocytosis and endocytosis provide a mechanism for rejuvenating or remodeling a cell membrane. Remember, uh, endocytosis is where you take up uh, material from extracellular fluid into the cell. So uh, you form a vesicle. Compared to exocytosis, it is where uh, we expel material from the cells into the extracellular fluid. Right. So uh, the endocytosis involves addition of membrane. Sorry, endocytosis involves the loss of membrane, and exocytosis involves addition of membrane. So when addition and loss of membrane um, occur continuously, okay. So basically, the area of the cells remain fairly constant. So now let's uh, compare uh, between passive transport and active transport. Just to uh, uh, recap a bit, passive transport involves simple diffusion as well as facilitated diffusion. And in facilitated diffusion, uh, we can use channel protein and we can use carrier protein. So, a simple uh, diffusion, example of simple diffusion is a movement of water that can always pass through plasma membrane. And example of facilitated diffusion is movement of water using aquaporin. Okay. Another example of facilitated diffusion using uh, glucose co using glucose transporter. And this glucose transporter will transport glucose into uh, the cell without using any ATP. And the shape of carrier protein uh, change due to the binding of glucose itself into the binding site. In active transport, you learn uh, about three different parts. The first one is uh, electrogenic pump that consists of proton pump as well as sodium potassium pump. And then in active transport also, you learn about co-transport including um, sucrose H plus co-transporter and Glucose Na plus co-transporter. And last but not least, you learn about bulk transport and it comprises of uh, endocytosis and exocytosis. Alright, 
So in active transport, uh, substance diffuse uh, against concentration gradient. Okay, and you need. ATP. So please remember that in active transport, this carrier protein change its shape due to the binding of phosphate group, and the phosphate group is donated by ATP. So compared to passive transport, the substance uh, transported for lowering concentration gradient, and no ATP is required. Alright students, so you have learned all theories uh, related to transport across plasma membrane. So now let's uh, test your understanding. Okay, so let's do a bit of um, scientific experiment using this graph. Okay, so this is the graph uh, to show glucose uptake over time in different age of guinea pig all right so uh, there are two guinea pig used 15 day old 15 days old guinea pig and one month old guinea pig all right and we have uh, 60 minutes of incubation time can you describe this graph Can you differentiate the glucose uptake of guinea pig at 20 minutes of time interval, uh, 40 minutes, and 60 minutes? Overall, 15 days guinea pig takes up higher concentration of radioactive sugar compared to 15, uh, one month old guinea pig, right? So, why there is different between the glucose uptake in red blood cell of two different age of guinea pig. Why the 15 days old guinea pig takes up more glucose compared to one month old guinea pig? What do you think? Okay, one month old guinea pig is uh, considered old in guinea pig okay 15 days old is considered like um, teenagers or it's considered young and remember that guinea pig they are very active at young age so since they are very active they uh, need more glucose as nutrient to conduct cellular respiration so they need higher uptake of glucose in red blood cell okay so to take up glucose into the red blood cell they will have more carrier protein all right so that's it for chapter three you have now discovered uh, structure of plasma membrane. You have learned about um, function of each structure in plasma membrane. You already learned about um, a function of membrane protein, and finally, you have learned about transport across plasma membrane that comprises of passive transport as well as.